Right, the story about that. This morning's sermon is God in Suffering, an introduction from the book of Job, chapter 1, verses 1 to 12. A friend um, a year and a half ago approached me uh, uh, to ask me to preach more on the book of Job. I'd spoke about it at my wife's uh, Thanksgiving service, and um, he, he wanted to know more about this character and uh, uh, what was contained within it, and he was keen for me to preach on it. Um, we do the first wee series for a few weeks, and then next year we'll have another foray into it um, as a kind of part two. Um, now, as a book, the structure of the Book of Job is really quite uh, uh, splendid, well done. Um, described by one commentator as a literary masterpiece. But it's also much more than that. It's powerfully insightful as a study of life and suffering and God and the heavenly realms. Job tackles a big word for you, theodicy, which is the subject of God and justice in the light of human suffering. And Christians and Jews and the people of Job's time believed three things about God. That God was almighty, that he was just and fair, and that all people in general terms are not innocent they all sin and do wrong and cause others pain and grief. By that logic, it emerges that Job's friends and other people throughout history presume that people suffer sometimes as a measure of how guilty in God's sight that they are. But that, however, also contravenes what the scripture teaches. In John 9, for example, Jesus was asked, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither, said Jesus. Well, I think most of us will be happy to agree that none of us are sinless. But some people clearly attempt to live genuine, godly, and pious lives. They aim to be upright in character, and they do not carry on sinning when they have confessed it but they seek to refrain from it in future. I'm not saying they get it right first time, but often when you, uh, you bring a problem to God and are truly repentant, he gives you the strength to uh, put that one behind you. Uh, there's usually a few more that need to be sorted out as time goes on, but um, that's the idea of repentance and having our sins um, dealt with. What we all know is that even the godless is not spared from suffering. And this is the enigma that lies at the heart of God's son Jesus' journey in life on earth too. So we have no right to expect exemption from pain and suffering, even though sadly sometimes it is exacerbated by well-meaning friends as well as by foes. How do we cope with this? Well, Job tells us that the best relationship that we can ever enjoy between God and between us as a human can be corrupted by a third party. That third party is known as our adversary, our false accuser, the one who intrudes to spoil our peace, one who is hell-bent on frustrating the potential blessings of that beautiful relationship between God and his creature as, as a person. Just as God delights in a righteous person like Job, any righteous person just like Job enjoys blessings. You can also delight in the security and assurance of their God as a foundation for the way they live their lives and for eternal hope. Firmly grounded in what God reveals through the Holy Scriptures. So I was penning that, and even as I read it again, I'm singing a hymn in my head. We have an anchor that keeps us so grounded, firm and deep in the Saviour's blood. 
Of course, all scripture is God-breathed. This book contains details and answers that only God could have known and revealed to us, that we might be informed, that we might be blessed and able to bless others as we share our understanding of God with them when the opportunities arise. This first section of the book is known as the prelude. It kind of sets the scene to what lies ahead. Who is Joel? What's he like? What is going on in the heavenly realms and so on? We learn there that Job is indeed pious. He's godly, he's good. But he's also a rich man, wise and successful. And above all, God rates him very highly indeed. The questions arise. How does God rate us? Job also intercedes for his family. Do we intercede for our families? Does God test us in a similar sort of challenge? He has with Satan in Job's life. These are just some of the questions, and you'll have others as you've read this section today. But later in chapter 2, verse 3 verses, we'll see that God um, we'll, we'll see that God accuse the Satan of un- afflicting Job for no good reason or for nothing. Um, in the actual Hebrew, uh, the, the devil, when he's, he's spoken about, is called the Satan, not just uh, the name Satan. Um, God's going to accuse Satan of uh, afflicting Job for no good reason or for nothing. And another cruel cruel test unfolds in chapter 2, verse 7. So do we undergo cruel tests as Satan seeks to damage our relationship with God or even to prevent us from having that beautiful relationship with God? Satan tests us so that our faith will collapse, will lose our hope. Well, I think we've established that suffering is part of life. But is it permitted by a just and loving God? What is our logic? Is there meaning? Is there even value? And will knowing these things change our outlook when we are under trial or facing various kinds of suffering? Paul in Romans chapter three, chapter five, verses three to five says, "Let us also glory in our sufferings." Isn't that a strange phrase? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance and turn character, and character gives us hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, whom he has given to us. So are you ready? Are you scared? Are you optimistic? Are you willing to journey into this first foray in the book of Job with us together? Here we go then, part one, verses one to 12. We're introduced to Job. He's the main character in the opening verses. He lives in a place called Ur, east of the Jordan, we're told. Possibly the same Ur, um, sorry, us, Ur, um, that Abraham was born in. Sometimes you get the same name in different places, Um, but maybe not. Four things are stated about him. That's four this time. Firstly, he's blameless. Second, he's upright. Third, that he fears or respects God. And fourth, he is someone who shuns evil. And we can make of these things that Job's a person who has integrity, who seeks to honor and live under God's standards and does not seek to gain from any wrongdoing of any kind. In life, he walks totally devoted to his God. Is that an enviable thing? 
Do you think that's an unrealistic thing for you? Can any of us have that said about us? That we walk totally devoted to our God. Do any of us want such a relationship with God? Had you been at the prayer breakfast earlier on, you would have heard about how special having an intimate relationship with God is. Now, the world that Job inhabits has described to us. He's got 10 children, three are girls and seven are sons. All these numbers um, are great Bible numbers. Uh, three, the Trinity, seven, and days that God took to create the world and have a rest and so on. So ten, um, and another good Bible number. What these uh, numbers are supposed to suggest to us, some scholars will say, is that Job is living the ideal life. Everything seems perfect. The numbers all stack up perfectly. Everything's aligned for Job. Then he's got some other uh, items that would be uh, that would show his wealth. He's got seven thousand sheep and three thousand camel, five hundred yoke of oxen and five hundred donkeys, and loads and loads of servants who work with him. Then we're told, verse three, he's the greatest and wealthiest man in the entire area that's described as in the East. And a wealthy family. And they hold regular feasts, get-togethers, and they all take their turn and the entire family participates, verse 4. There appears to be love and not jealousy. There doesn't seem to be division or arguments in this family, and that would be, in my experience, a rare thing indeed. Um, sibling rivalry and all that kind of stuff as people uh, grow up. Now, before Moses introduced the law, fathers in those days would act as a priest for their family. And verse 5 tells us that Job acts as a priest after these celebrations. He offers sacrifices to God just in case any of his children have stepped out of line, they've sinned. And then he mentions what is the great sin of this book, or cursed God. Now, curse is the opposite to the word bless. You see, God deserves our full affection, our true adoration and our utmost respect. And when we fail to do that, we fail to give him what he's due. And in a sense, it's like making him a curse. He's not given the importance. We just push him to the side. We can do this by the choices and the way we, we live if we live without him. And that's the sin that Satan predicts that Job will succumb to later on. He will curse God. Spoiler alert. Job doesn't curse God. When we are then beamed up into heaven in verse 6, a council meeting is taking place. God and the angels and this Satan are all present. The Hebrew calls him this Satan because behind that phrase is an indication of his role. And his role is to be the accuser to really doubt, and to be our adversary. So God asks Satan what he's been up to. His reply is that he's been roaming the earth. And there is a play on that word to roam or to rove here, which means that he does exactly what he is called, his name suggests. He's been running about looking for people to accuse, to cast doubt into their minds, and to be their adversary. Well, the commentator says he's been spying on people, not for good reasons. Now, since God is all-knowing, he knows everything, he then next asks the question, 
which you know is the answer to, but he asks it for our benefit. Have you considered my servant Job? And God states how righteous and blameless Job is in verse 8. He says, there is no one in all the earth who is like him. Now, Job's not the first person that said these kind of nice things said about him. Noah and some others have had wonderful things said about them by God in the past. Others have found favour in God's sight. And I wish that more than most things could be said about me. He was blameless in God's sight. I wonder if it could be said about you too. Satan is quick to undermine God's delight in Job. Verse 9, he jumps right in. No wonder Job serves you. It's because you've blessed them so much. Satan casts more doubt. And he's effectively accusing God of being a proud man. Proud of a man called Job. And foolishly. Because you've blessed him so much. No wonder you see him as righteous. No wonder he does good to honour you. I want you to know that this is deliberately dodgy logic. Righteousness being the result of divine blessing, not the other way around. When we're blessed so much, we so desire to be righteous rather than we'll only be righteous if we're blessed. But that's the way the accuser works. He tries to confuse our thinking. You see, God gifted Job in the first place. He didn't bless Job because Job honoured God. In verse 10, further states, God has put a hedge of yew trees around him and made everything that he does effectively turn to gold. So Job's true righteousness within himself has never been put to the test because he's had this protection and blessing from God. Interesting, those who walk with God, walk under God's will, have this hedge of blessing around them too. It is named as the Holy Spirit, who is our helper, our guide, and our protector. The Satan then has the audacity to attempt to put God to the test in verse 11. And he then doubles the stakes and says, take the blessings away and Job will surely curse you. Here's the accuser at his worst again. It's like he's asking God to doubt both Job's righteousness and the, the praise that Job gives to God by claiming it's simply founded on this special blessing that God has given him, rather than something genuinely within the person, Job himself. And then, if God had to uh, uh, meet with Job, if Job came into God's presence and they came face to face, after all this blessing had been removed, well, Job curse God. That's the challenge. Later, we'll we see that Job does end up in the court of heaven with God there as the judge. And he comes face to face with his God. And according to the scriptures, the day of judgment is going to be like that for us too. Whether life's a test or not, our test is to get ourselves right with God long before we end up in that court. Verse 12 closes with the Satan having permission to put Job to the test. Notice he gets permission, but he's under God's sovereignty and rules. And the word hand is uh, very powerfully used in this book. 
that action, that power, it means much more than um, um, just uh, the object of a hand. It's not God's hand that's going to put Job to the test, but the Satan's hand. Meantime, the very blessed Job is about to have his world tilted on its axis or upside down or whatever phrase you want to use. So, we're near the end of their first foray into this book. What have we learned? Suffering will come to us all. Maybe some of us are in a period of suffering at the moment. And the obvious question is, how are you dealing with that suffering? How will you deal with the suffering that will come? How will you cope when the going gets really tough? And as a Christian fellowship, we're your family. We can help. Do you find this Christian fellowship a place where you can listen and pray for one another? where you can journey together, whether you can weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And does it help us to realize that God only allows us to endure suffering for good purposes? Many people can't get their head around that, that God would allow us to endure pain and that there's something positive behind it. When we know God, what he's like, it makes all the difference in the world. And that leads us all to ask a very important question. Have we met God yet? Do we have that Holy Spirit hedge around us? Do we live in a life that God would have us lead? Intimate and beautiful and wonderful. That relationship that that Satan wants to prevent us from having. If we've not met God yet, let me say there's no time like the present. The sooner, the better. Life is definitely richer with God in it, even if the Satan comes and puts us to the test through whatever suffering he throws at us. Remember that third party, that the Satan. He wants us not to have this beautiful and special relationship with our God. But please don't let that loser beat you out of this relationship your God wants to have with you. Amen. I want to invite Jim to pray. Do you want to give him the lollipop, Mike? Um, this one's going dodgy. Thank you. You found lollipop. Lollipop sounds tasty. Right here, here's this chair.